Hello, so I'm going to be talking about a project that CoThink was commissioned to do uh, on behalf of the STF for improving SysMD's integration testing infrastructure. I'm Sam, I go by he, him and they, them pronouns. I joined CoThink in 2023 and worked on this as my first project. My background is mainly in capture the flag competitions and cybersecurity stuff, and in my spare time, I'm an avid speedcuber. So who likes Bash? <laughs> To start with, I'm going to go over how the testing infrastructure worked at the start of the project. Uh, so on the right-hand side, that the right? yeah. on the right-hand side, you can see uh, test dash functions, and all of the test.sh files combined and scaled down to five percent. This is the bash test runner part of the integration testing suite. There's also 216 shell scripts involved in running the tests on the target, totaling 31,692 lines. But those are the valuable bits of the test suite. I'm quickly going to walk you through how all of this works. So each test directory has a makefile in it. These are all sim links to the same makefile from test01 basic. You can run each makefile on its own to run a test, but the CI runs test slash run integration test.sh. That runs every test in sequence and collects coverage results. Uh, so the interesting stuff starts in test.sh. First, uh, Actually, this is test dash functions. First, it makes a disk image. These are the code sections highlighted in red. This is a very involved process, but it's only run once. Each test then takes a snapshot of the disk before running. Uh, this snapshot is then discarded afterwards. Next, it copies a bunch of files from the host system using the code highlighted in green. This is because you want to test the system that you've just built, and it's built with your host system's ABI. This is one of the most fragile steps of the whole process. It depends on the layout of the host system, and I cer assume certain files are present at predetermined places. Each test can also install its own files via the test depend files hook. The example on the right here shows test 75 resolve D. You can, installing, you can see it installing the not D binary, which is a DNS server for resolve D to be tested against. The code housed in blue is responsible for booting the image. Uh, this can use either QEMU or nspawn. There's more command line options set that we're glossing over, including subtest environment variables, uh, but these are the important ones for how tests are run. So most tests have one script and one service. Uh, some have multiple services, some might not have a script. A lot have a lot more than one script since they're split up into subtests. The parameters for the, for the generated unit file are in the meson.build file in the test directory, but we'll get onto that later. So now in Magenta is the code which handles getting the results. This mounts a disk image and checks the slash failed and slash test OK files. It saves the journal logs and checks coverage results. If you've ever had to debug a failing test, you'll know how helpful having these journal files is. So I'm now going to go over some of the issues we encounter with this approach. Firstly, loopback mounting causing, causes numerous issues, which are both a nuisance for developers and actually prevent running the tests in some environments. The fundamental issue is that uh, with this approach, you, a lot of your files end up owned by root. This means that you're constantly having to use sudo to do anything. Using the host binaries to build the images also creates issues when you're building for different distros. Keeping per distro file lists up to date is a pain, not to mention that distros already do this work. Additionally, it makes cross-distro testing a pain, requiring a virtual machine or a container of the testing distro to perform all building and testing operations. One quirk of QEMU is that dash append can only be used to pass kernel arguments if you are direct kernel booting. This means you are supplying a kernel image to QEMU directly. This means it doesn't work at all for testing systemd boot or UKI-based systems. Uh, checking the results of the test without root is also tricky. Uh, I'll go over how we solve these issues later on the in the presentation. In order to run the test without manually building a QEMU command line, we had a few different off-the-shelf options. MakeOSI QEMU works well for images it has built itself. However, it cannot be used with a pre-built pre image. Libvirt can use pre-built images, but doesn't provide any integrations with other tools, like SWTPM for starting TPMs. Additionally, we wanted an interface similar to systemd nspawn so that we could minimize the amount of tool-specific code. The outcome of this was systemd vm spawn, a new systemd tool which acts as a wrapper for QEMU while providing rich integrations with external tools and exposing an interface that matches systemd nspawn where possible. A feature vm spawn shares with Mercosi QEMU is the ability to start a VM from a root directory. 
leveraging Versio FSD to host the directory and provide a block device for QEMU. One quirk of this approach is that UID namespacing issues can occur, uh, so the private user flag was added to prevent these issues. As a brief aside, transient units enable a lot of the functionality in VM spawn. They're effectively a normal systemd unit, but their properties are supplied by a dbus call instead of via a unit file. Combined with scope units, they provide a simple way to ensure externally launched programs are already stopped when VM spawn finishes. Additionally, VM spawn offers integration with systemd machine D. When it starts a VM, it will register itself with machine D, so machine Kotlin knows about the VM and can perform actions on it. One of the issues we encountered around loopback mounting was recovering the journal without root permissions. Our solution to this was to add support for journal D to forward journal events over a socket. This allows VM spawn to make, socket, uh, make a socket connection and then catch all of the logs with systemd journal remote. So that's how we'd like to run the test image. So how do we build them? We're using MakeOSI. It's a general purpose image builder with users outside of the systemd test suite, so they're shared maintenance. The example config is the Arch Linux specific package list, uh, just to give a taste of what the config looks like. To grossly simplify, it installs distro packages for a range of configured distributions and runs scripts for further customization. It uses systemd repo and kernel install to make a bootable disk image. I've included visualization of the source files for fairness. The colors are arbitrary, uh, alternating colors, so lots of tiny ones don't run together. While 120 files and 2,700 lines doesn't sound that much better, the way MakeOSI's conditional configuration works lends itself better to many smaller files. There's more than 100,000 fewer characters because most of the lines are short, and the big files are packaging scripts that result in real packages you could choose to install or distribute on your system. To make things as simple as possible for current developers, we chose to use Meson to define the integration tests. This allows defining integration tests the same way that unit tests are defined. On the top right, you can see Meson code for defining an integration test, and on the bottom right, you can see the top level Meson config for running the integration tests. Strictly speaking, tests can also run without a disk image or a bootloader and can use direct kernel boot, so dash append could still be used and the credentials which aren't a uh, kernel command line then get passed as part of the appended kernel command line. This is certainly not the most legible image of the slide, uh, but it effectively shows the layers of the integration tests and where information gets passed. So on the top level, it goes from the meson config, then to the integration test wrapper, to Mikozy QEMU, starting systemd journal remote, uh, it then boots QEMU with the credentials, with systemd boot and systemd stub parsing the credentials that are passed to the Linux kernel, should then pass to systemd, which are then passed to the test, then the test logs over the, uh, the notify vsoc and uh, exits sending exit code to systemd, which then sends its uh, exit code over the notify vsoc, which make OSI handles, uh, after systemd shuts down, and then Kremu exits the exit code. Uh, the, v the exit code that was sent over the vsoc is then reported back to the integration test wrapper, which turns that into a test pass, fail, or skip. So what are the benefits of this approach? It's a lot easier to run the make OSI based tests. I never got all of the bash based integration tests to pass and could never figure out how my environment was broken. But make OSI has a much cleaner environment and there's packages you can install to just get it, to get it to just work. Not needing root to run the test suite is very convenient. Meson's parallel test runner is also pretty nice. If you've got a powerful enough machine, you can probably run everything in about 10 minutes. We tried it on a Threadripper, but ended up with IO bottlenecks, so I never got that far. The network tests have made their way into an integration test suite, because it's trivial to add Python to the image with MakeOSI, and a lot of work with the bash test suite. So what's missing? We didn't focus our attention on coverage or sanitizers until the, near the end of the work, because the priority was to get everything running. Deciding to use a single image and have tests run in an ephemeral snapshot means that we lose the coverage reports, though, since they, don't, since they get written to disk. Preserving the images also doesn't fix this, because we want to be able to run without root, and mount FSD won't solve that since this isn't a signed immutable image. Though most of the work we ran, through most of the work, we ran the tests in particle mode, where a read-only rootfs generates slash etsy on first boot. Unfortunately, etsy Linux decides whether it's running by if etsy etsy Linux exists, 
and this is in the constructor of the PID1 process. So there's no way to populate slash etc. before running systemd. A few tricks might be possible to defer anything that needs SE Linux until after temp files was run, re-exec systemd and then rerun temp files so it can fix labels afterwards. But this is fragile. And what if you need something SE Linux dependent before temp files? It would be better for SE Linux to check user lib SE Linux and then gracefully handle Etsy SE Linux being missing. A surprising amount of development time went into trying to figure out how to rebuild test images only when needed. And me's on test dependencies, unconditionally causing a rebuild beforehand, didn't help. We can't have perfectly deterministic builds with Make OSI because it depends on a package repository. But it would be nice to know we don't have to rebuild when none of its config has changed. Given how many files Make OSI config is, it's really hard to get those dependencies into Meson. Ninja is powerful enough to handle this, but Meson might require some extension to make it work. So in conclusion, we've walked through the bash script, shown off the mspawn, and covered how it's been replaced by Make OSI, Meson, and a small Python script. Coverage is still running with the bash, with the bash script in CentOS CI, and testing the whole assistant after making changes should be a lot more accessible. We greatly appreciate the SDF funding this work, and it's been a privilege for CodeThink to be involved. Additionally, I would like to thank the SystemD core maintainers for their expert assistance and guidance along with the project. Uh, thank you, I'll now take any questions. Questions? I can ask questions if there are. Uh, oh, yes, there are, excellent. This is a more general one. Uh, how do you test uh, systemd, for example, but not necessarily, uh, let's say systemd, against a distribution, and uh, a distribution may change, uh, like some other packages may change, and, uh, and, the, uh, and tests fail. Mm -hmm. how, how do you handle this? Well, I believe that's part of the, so it's, the CI is running GitHub Actions, and it runs a matrix across loads of distributions. And so it will run the CI for each distribution. And so that should hopefully catch changes in a distro when they happen. But that's, it's hard to test something that's external to your project. Yeah, so it, when this happens, well, if we know the maintainers of the things that break, we go and yell at them. Otherwise, <laughs> uh, we fix things. But yes, it, it happens. So we do not snapshot distribution because we don't want to. We want to know at any point in time if the stuff we are doing works, right? So uh, that's kind of by design. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. Yes, a follow-up question on this one is, uh, how often do you get uh, build issues that are, or test issues that are due to systemd, and how often are they due to other components? Kernel, whatever else. Uh, this is probably a better question for Luca, because I don't actually run the tests anymore, because I finished the project. Yeah, yeah, so Sam was involved to do the boot up, and now we, we have to taken it from them uh, two months ago, when was it? Three months ago? About um, March. So, I would say when, when I'm doing development, um, it's mostly my staff that breaks the tests. In the CI, w depends on what you're changing, right? So uh, if you're doing code changes, I would say about one in three PRs are introducing bugs that are caught by tests. And the rest um, are fail due to flakiness. But the flakiness that we see is not due to distribution changing things. I mean, the, the arches are breaking stuff every time, all the time, but all the distros are more stable. Um, the issues we see are with our tests being flaky uh, because of the environment. For example, right now there is a bug in Hyper-V where if you run on QMU KVM on top of QMU KVM on top of Hyper-V and your nested KVM you want to use secure boot, um, Hyper-V crashes every now and then, <laughs> um, which is not great. So we cannot test secure boot. Uh, 
yeah. other issues it's like uh, we found we find that when we test a lot of devices and drivers storage drivers SCSI uh, Virtaio SCSI QME also crashes with SIG invalid one out of four test runs so these are these are the pain points distribution things change every now and then packages move that's fine we, it's, it's, those are easy to fix right so the approach we've taken is that we build system D from the packages that um, the distribution themselves use. So for Debian and Ubuntu, we use the Debian and Ubuntu packaging to build system D for Arch, the Arch packaging for Fedora, the Fedora spec files. Um, so it, the builds are very well integrated, but you know, sometimes the dependency changes, files move and things happen. Uh, does that answer your question? Excellent. Any other questions? Yes. I just wondered uh, about the coverage. What's is there like a because it's new, not a new setup? What's Say the again, reason sorry. for that? Can you can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Um, so the coverage is done with the old setup, right? Yes. Is there a, a technical reason why it's not in the setup, or is it just it still needs some work? Uh, so we got towards coverage at basically towards the end of the project. Um, and we weren't able to find a solution in time. And so I think this is just what ended up happening. Um, yeah, basically we are waiting for somebody brave enough <laughs> to, to do that. You, got, you mentioned the, the problem, right? The images are ephemeral, so we lose yeah. the um, C, C, no, GCA <sighs> files, the things that uh, are generated. So we need to grab those, and we don't have a way to do that. We need some hacks in there. Um, yeah. And it requires time. Yes, welcome. Um, so when, uh, I have a question for you then, um, mm -hmm. when s starting to work on this, uh, what was the hardest part apart, uh, as part of your onboarding and ramping up working uh, on System D? Trying to understand how to run the tests, I found quite difficult, but I think that's mainly because I didn't actually go and read through the docs, and I, didn't, I couldn't find the docs was one problem. <laughs> I didn't know they existed, and so looking for them wasn't something that worked. Um, what else? Uh, I think understanding how the disk gets built at the start took a long time, and uh, when, like, uh, when I would need to rebuild different components when I was building VMSpawn, uh, became quite confusing, but I think overall it was, once I got used to it, it was very much a good development process. Other questions? Yes. Uh, do you have any plan to run uh, on the sanitizers? Uh, so we, end, we did try and run ASAN and UBSAN in the end. Uh, we had some issues around like how long they took to build. I think this was because uh, where the way we were doing it was building with flags for MakeOSI itself, which ended up building like whole system components with ASAN and UBSAN. I believe Frantisek has done more work around when sanitizers run and what's up with that, um, but I'm not 100% sure of the current situation. I'd give it, <laughs> Luca wants to answer. <laughs> Uh, we have one job that runs uh, Fedora 40, I think. The Fedora 40 job runs with sanitizers. Yeah, yeah. If you check the GitHub actions, it should say one of them. Uh, maybe it's 40, maybe it's raw height. I don't know. But one of them has sanitizer and it's slower. And yeah, as Sam said, it takes forever. That's why we have only one job. But yeah, we have that. Huh? So uh, maybe one comment. Uh, I don't know if it was. Um, uh, apparent from the, the way that uh, he was mentioning the talk, but this stuff where you can pass credentials down uh, to parameterize your uh, test run, and then you take journal out via the, and execute via the socket, then very nice thing about this is that it is completely independent of our test suite. You can use the exact same stuff, pass credential in via SMBIOS and get things out of, of VSOC for any VM runs. Uh, you do not need any specific code in there. You don't need to deploy your own clients, your cloud init, whatever. As long as you have system D256, uh, you can do this stuff just with QMU command line parameters. And it all works magically for any kind of workloads, which is kind of magic. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Questions? Any more questions, comments? How much time do we have? Almost out. Okay, going once, going twice. Thank you. Thank you.